like how will it affect our lives and will it help will it simplify will it make it easier for us to transact and do business with each other and to transfer money uh, our children and ourselves may have to find the answer to these questions in the future when the digital euro becomes if the digital euro becomes something um real so we want to delve into these questions and more questions over the next hour and uh, i would like to say that you are all very welcome and uh, welcome to the ecb my name is ronan sheridan and i'm very delighted to be your moderator today now, as i say we'll be discussing all things digital euro we have received many requests from you over the last weeks and months to involve you more in the investigation phase of the digital euro and so we're trying to add a new twist to our usual seminar events by making this a bit more interactive than we would have done before we're very keen to hear from you over the next hour and so we'll try and work together at focusing on particular topics which we will then uh, delve into in a bit more detail the outline of the of the hour maybe to give you a bit more context we will have a short presentation or a presentation shortly uh, from my colleagues on the panel here beside me and then we'll focus on two topics which we'll explore and decide on together then we can exchange about them have a bit more of an in-depth discussion about those and then we should have some time left at the end for remaining questions or any open comments you wish to make or address so before i introduce this, our speakers our, our, our my colleagues here as well just a couple of housekeeping rules the usual really one can you please try and keep your mute your microphones on mute unless you're speaking can you turn your videos on if you well we encourage you to turn your videos on so we can make this a bit more of an engaging discussion and if you have any issues technical issues with your uh, with, with logging in or accessing the various polls that we'll put to you in the next uh, while please use the host uh, contact host in the chat function and one of our colleagues will try and talk and deal with your issues as soon as they possibly can so with that let me um introduce Evelyn Whitlocks who's the leading digital euro project here at the ECB no small task and Jürgen Schaff who is in charge of public communications for the digital euro they will update us on the latest developments and uh, some considerations around the project and where we are at the moment and really without any further introduction let me hand over to them oh I should add one further thing which is that the seminar is being recorded so that uh, you, we, while not live right now, it will be posted to our website channel in the next uh, few days. So if you're joining us right now online, you're all, as I say, very welcome. And for those of you who are joining us and sharing the air with us sometime in the future, you, of course, are also very welcome. So over to you, Evelyn. Thank you, Ronan. So let me uh, do an introduction on the Digital Euro uh, to get us started maybe good to know um, that the a majority of the central banks which is on the next slide are working on cbdc so the ecb is not working in isolation nine out of ten banks are working on those more than half of them are already developing or even running uh, concrete experiments and more than two-thirds consider it likely or might possibly issue a retail cbdc in short or medium term the reasons uh, behind the increased work on CBDC are diverse, uh, but in general, we see a couple of reasons for uh, central banks to, uh, to dive into this topic. First of all are the emergence of cryptocurrencies and the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that accelerated the work on the CBDCs. Next to that, we see that in advanced econ economics, uh, economies, uh, apologies, uh, financial stability uh, has increased in, in its importance. And finally, uh, we see in that in some countries, uh, CBDCs are seen uh, to alleviate limited uh, operating hours, for example, or uh, uh, shorten the length of the transaction uh, chains that are there. But from here, which is more general, let us zoom in on the digital euro. On the next slide, you see uh, the two key objectives that uh, the ECB has defined for issuing a digital euro. The first consideration is that we find it important that there remains a monetary anchor also in the digital space. As we all know, uh, in the current environment, there is always the access to cash if you want to have access to central bank money. And in, or in, in order to keep this 
uh, confidence in the co uh, convertibility at par, we believe it's also important that in a digital age, where uh, in some environments you can't even pay with cash, and they take uh, the e-commerce space, it's also important that people can uh, convert their monies into uh, uh, a central bank currency. And that currency, of course, or central bank money should be widely accessible to the prospective, prospective users in the euro area countries. A second key objective that we see is uh, that we need to defend the strategic autonomy of the euro area, where we think it's important that we uh, decrease our dependency of non-European payment solutions and that we can increase the econo economic efficiency of, the, uh, of this area. Because, as you all know, if there are only few competitors, then it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to contain the cost. So we believe it's important that there is something to choose from. If we then move to the next slide, there you see uh, the definition that we use. So we say the digital euro is a digital central bank liability for retail payments. So we're not talking about wholesale payments today uh, of citizens and businesses in the entire euro area. A couple of key messages that uh, we have been given and we will continue uh, to give and we take in on board in the whole investigation phase is that we believe that the digital euro should complement and not substitute cash or wholesale central bank deposits. Another important message is that supervised intermediaries, so banks, payment service providers, PSPs, will facilitate the distribution of the digital euro. And finally, we believe that the digital euro as a source of innovation and a public good shall not crowd out the banks or hinder, hinder in the innovation in payments. If we then go to the next slide, here you see uh, uh, the program plan that we have. We have embarked in the investigation phase in October last year, and we are planned to go back to the governing council in Q3 2023. Um, so, also maybe on the comment earlier said uh, that it uh, took us some time uh, to be able to, to do the reach out to the full market. This was also because we were in a startup phase of the investigation phase. So, in Q4 last year, we have uh, spent on uh, staffing the program. I myself, for example, started uh, the 1st of January and to do our first analysis. At the end of the first quarter, we have published uh, a focus group report, which we have done at the end of last year. Uh, and we have discussed and uh, shown what we think are the use cases that we should prioritize for the digital euro uh, as a starting point for discussion and interaction with the market. Currently, we are working on the new batch of uh, uh, design uh, elements. Uh, and that we have shared, for example, with the ERPB, and I will come back on our governance uh, in the, on the next slide um, uh, at the beginning of April. And we are now in dialogue with the market on these topics. So those are the ones that you see at the bottom of Q2. For, so, for example, on and offline, but also the transfer mechanism and also the options that we have to moderate the uh, amount uh, of digital euros in circulation. And we will do this step by step over uh, the coming quarters. Um, the planning is, is that all design analysis have been done by the end of Q1 2023 and that we have taken all decisions. Uh, and uh, then we take one last holistic view on the digital euro because we need to slice the elephant in order to, to come to the final design. But some decisions that we might uh, take now in principle might uh, need to be reconsidered if you see the whole uh, of the whole. So there is a, is a, a, a final review of the holistic picture at the beginning of Q2 2023. And then the rest of the time we will use to prepare the uh, end advice, uh, which will be an advice whether or not to go to the implementation phase. Uh, and if the advice would be to go to an implementation phase, it needs to be accompanied by an implementation uh, plan. So this is a timeline. Uh, it says a long and windy road, but I can tell you, uh, having to think this through and to discuss it with everybody, a two year is really a challenge for us. 
Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and that is the last slide that I will present to you. Uh, and it says something about how we govern and how we do uh, the stakeholder management. So in the middle, you see the organization within the Euro system. So that is the project team at the bottom that reports into the high level task force, as we call it, within the ECB. And that reports via the executive board to the governing council. But we're not working in isolation. So we work also very closely with the political stakeholders, which you see on the left hand side. We have an e European Commission and ECB contact group that meet every month. Uh, and also uh, there we investigate certain topics which will be taken along for the uh, political stakeholders and that we take along in our, uh, in our project, these analysis. And political stakeholders, I don't think I need to explain to you, but are the European Parliament, the European Council and the European Commission. On the right hand side, uh, you see the market, market stakeholders um, and we have uh, in our program governance the market advisory group uh, in which we have uh, selected experts that are there on a personal title. Uh, they have joined us from the beginning uh, and then we have announced uh, beginning of April that the um, discussion with the market we want to uh, channel via the ERPB, the Euro Retail Payments Board. And there we do that in um, uh, batches again. So we do a technical seminar where everybody can uh, uh, join and listen in. Then there is a written procedure. And then with the major stakeholders, we have a bilateral interchange. And that input we take along uh, into the decision making. And of course, we also have uh, next to that the special interest groups. And uh, this session that we have today is also to cater for having an interaction with each other there. And with that, I hand back to Ronan. Thank you uh, very much, Evelyn. So really a lot of, uh, I think, outline of a lot of complexity, uh, a really detailed project and so many stakeholders really that uh, it's just such a huge task. The more uh, those of us who are involved can understand and see how many um, moving parts there are in this, in this project. So it's really good to have your involvement today as well. So um, we sent you an email last week on the topics that we would focus on today. So now we would like, as I said at the start, to decide what those particular topics are that we should focus on in more depth and more detail. So we have a quick poll for you. And uh, the way in which you can access this poll are via WebEx, the WebEx screen in front of you that you're, you're using today. Uh, I mean, just check in the drop down menus that you can see the chat. Uh, and then under the, that you're under the Slido window, um, and then for you should begin to see this um, this uh, this set of, this multiple choice question we have for you. You can enter the link Slido.com, and uh, once you're there, you can use the passcode Digital Euro, all one word, and that will also get you onto this uh, onto this quick uh, this quick poll. And then also you can you can scan a QR code as well, which you should see on the screen. Now the questions, the multiple choice questions we have for you are which topics tied to the digital euro would you like to discuss and we have limited this to four privacy financial inclusion comparison with crypto assets and then the final one is product features and design so when we have a sense of how what your your feeling is of this as a group then we can focus on those two topics in particular and then as we mentioned at the start when we have a bit more time at the end of the session we can then also address any remaining questions or comments that you have so I think that um, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, topic because all of these are extremely interesting topics. I mean, all of the, I mean, we know privacy is something that has become, has been very interesting for uh, right, in, right from the start of the digital euro con consultation back in 2020. And uh, financial inclusion is super important. It's very important for us in the ECB. And uh, I'm sure it's very important to you too. Um, not everybody is, has access to electronic services in the same way, shape or form that others have. In terms of the product features and design, well, personally, that seems like a very exciting aspect of this because it could, of course, we're still in the in the in the at the stage of deciding what it is. So it could be many different things, and uh, and we have to uh, we're still obviously in this investigation phase, trying to find out what it is that we would do with that. Um, and of course, we all know that the comparison to crypto is something which is, you know, what, what is an asset, what is a currency, and uh, you probably have a sense of how, how we feel about that if you've been following us at all in the last while. 
Certainly, if I look now at uh, at the the kind of responses, and I think you can see these too on the on the on the the thing, the product features and design look like they are they're streaking ahead in the lead. And then it's between privacy. Well, no, great, thank you, whoever just uh, added an extra <laughs> answer in there. Much appreciated. That I don't have to make some kind of choice of Solomon. Um, so uh, so then let's focus on privacy then as well, which of course is super important. So then let's take these two, product features and design and privacy as the two that we'll focus on and for the more in-depth discussion that we have over the next few minutes. So then taking the first one, product features and design, um, I suppose I would say that in, by way of introduction to this, before I hand over to Jürgen, uh, designing a digital euro has to meet a wide set of cast characteristics. And at the heart of this is how it is going to be used by citizens and businesses and those who will, uh, who will make this a reality, in fact. I mean, we, we can do so much, but then people have to use it. So then we will come to another poll. So we will ask you uh, another pop-up question, um, which we uh, then will, the pop-up question, what is the, um, what, what is the feature that is the most important to you as a potential digital Euro user? So what feature is most important to you as a potential digital Euro user? And this is not the same as the last uh, choice. We're not going to just focus on that answer. Um, we just want to understand a bit and get a sense from yourselves what it is that, that uh, how you feel. And uh, we will be really uh, keen to know that because while I do that, and while you do that, while, while you're kind of figuring out how you want to answer that, um, I turn to Jürgen Schaaf to give a bit more detail on this. Jürgen, yeah. over to you. Thank you very much, Ronan. And thank you very much for choosing that question, <laughs> uh, which is, of course, to our parts very close and important and uh, we cannot give you now the details of how a digital euro in the end at the front end would look like in the future so whether it's a wallet or how the wallet would look like but to bring you a bit closer cases uh, where people would be able to use a digital euro, a digital euro so the payment situation in which people might use a digital euro we have prioritize those use cases. So the first version of the digital euro will probably not cover everything, but a couple of them will gain priority without having said that the others will not follow because definitely a digital euro will need to be future-proof and open to developments that are even not foreseeable now. So what we prioritized was and is that person-to-person uh, -person payments is important. That is, so I could pay to Evelyn, like handing over a banknote, or to Ronan, a banknote. Um, I would then transfer from my device, whatever that looked like. So that's person to person. Uh, another high priority is consumer to business. That is where you pay. So you go into a shop in the grocery and you pay at the cashier. Or you order something online and you would then pay with the digital euro. That, that are the example from c to b or consumer to business and then payments to government or the other way around one major example is of course that you might be able to pay taxes with a digital euro and the other way around is that social transfers allowances and the like could be transmitted transferred by the government which is in uh, of particular importance and usefulness in emergency cases where transfers from the government has to be have to be paid out quickly. The other two use cases like business is, is important, but it will not have the highest priorities in our investigation. And likewise, the machine initiated payments fully automated in between machines might also come only later. So here you have at least a overview of our priorities for the digital euro 1.0 if you will and for the time being let's stop here and then discuss a bit more detail in the q a thank you jürgen thank you very much yeah very interesting that central bank money and that the direct claims to central bank is something that people are uh, are most interested in indeed so um i think now we will uh, open the floor to some questions. So if uh, if anybody has raised their hand, 
or you know the virtual hand of course and would like to um to give us any thoughts questions comments on what Jurgen has said or anything else with regard to this uh, we would be very very open and really would like to hear from you so i think um it's uh it's uh, it's always a bit difficult for people to get going and uh and start typing in your your uh, obviously very happily, thank you very much for your engagement in actually already voting one way or the other, but uh, it certainly would be great for us to get uh, a number of questions. So um, I see that uh, Wojtek has raised his hand. So um, thank you very much. Wojtek, maybe we start with you. And then if you would just unmute your microphone and yeah, thank you for, uh, for, for sharing your video with us as well. And over to you for your, your question or your comment. Yes, uh, thank you so much for, the, for this event and for the invitation. Um, a short question about the design. Uh, why do you seem to, or maybe I am misunderstood, but why do you seem to exclude from the start, uh, you know, the, that the ECB would uh, be the operator itself of the system? In the sense, why why is it uh, it's, uh, is it private operators that would be regulated uh, that that you would uh, that you assume to? as the future operators of, of, of the digital euro. Uh, we've been uh, following the Swedish uh, discussions, for instance, and uh, they are very much open about, uh, you know, that kind of uh, you know, arbitrage between public operators and private ones regulated. Thank you. Thank you. So, Jürgen, Evelyn, would you like to take that question now? Or we, can we take another question first, or do you want to take this now? I can take it now. Great. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Um, well, indeed, we foresee um, a hybrid approach to issuing and distributing the digital euro. So the, the underlying asset will definitely come from the ECB. It will be on the balance sheet of the ECB, and it will have all the features of central bank money. That is the stability, the liquidity, the reliability, and the finality when you pay and settle this. But the intention is not to set up a distribution system that is completely run by the European Central Bank and the Euro system. So we foresee then next to this um, issuance of the asset, uh, a distribution model system frame, if you will, details need to be spelled out and later decided, that definitely foresee a role for the private sector because we believe that, first of all, the allocation of credit, that, that's one important thing, should continue to come from the banks. And second of all, the innovative power of the private sector to develop front-end solution, to come up with new services, and all this, this is much better placed in the private sector, where there might be competition. On the other hand, it needs to be regulated to avoid a too granular fragmentation or ideally to avoid fragmentation at all. So um, the, the vision is indeed a hybrid tiered framework where we issue the underlying asset and the role and the level of involvement of the private sector needs to be seen in more detail over time in the investigation phase and later. But it's definitely foreseen that there's a cooperative solution or let's say a public private partnership. Great. Thank you for that. Thanks very much. So great. Thanks to everybody who has since um, added in a number of questions. So maybe we take a number of questions together so that we can then uh, get um, a, a more rounded response then from all the questions we get. I'm also mindful of the time so that we move on to the second topic uh, in due course. So so over to Gerhard. Uh, Gerhard Humer, you have a, a question as well. So over to you, please. Thank you. I'm from SME United, and we look into the topic mainly from a point of view of small merchants. Um, and from this point of view, of course, the digital euro may become a very interesting opportunity for merchants to have, let's say, payment systems for customers online and offline, which are less expensive than the current solutions. Um, and my question is now on the design is, you said in the introduction, that you want not to crowd out the banks and you also now spoke about this hybrid model but should we be afraid that if you don't bypass the current payment systems with the digital euro 
that uh, it will not become cheaper for uh, merchants when you also have to to to, to involve the banks and the schemes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera? Or is there a possibility to bypass them and to make it really a, an attractive, cheap model where you can pay, uh, execute payments directly from the consumer to the merchant without uh, the costly system between? Very interesting and very much a good question. So before we take that, um, I see Jonas Gross also has a question uh, or a comment. Jonas, over to you. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation for having this event. It's really great to have also associations being heard. So thanks for that. Um, you have mentioned in the initial presentation that basically one of the key goals of the digital euro is to defend strategic autonomy, which I think is a really great uh, thing. Here, let's now assume, and I know there is no decision has been taken yet, but if the ECB decides to issue a digital euro, would this also mean that this digital euro will be like provided, developed by a payment provider and by a tech provider that is based in the euro area because it's like focused on the euro area? Or is it also possible that assuming um, the council will proceed with developing a digital euro that also like a party that is not based in the euro area can um, yeah, support with the development of the infrastructure? Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks very much. So maybe we take one or two more. And um, so Mark Beckman, uh, Mark, you have a question or a comment? Yeah, thanks a lot also from my side uh, for organizing this event. I work for Positive Money Europe and we think it's really important that citizens are being included and their voice being heard in this design process on the digital euro. And as this is an invitation only event, we organized a survey beforehand uh, on the digital euro and asked people questions about their views. People shared many concerns with us about the importance of privacy, the environmental footprint of digital currencies, as well as the power that private banks and finance have over people. And we asked, roughly 100 people participated in the survey, and we were asked one question about the proposed holding limits for digital euro accounts at 3,000 euros. And about a quarter of people said that they wouldn't use digital euro accounts if such a limit would be instituted. So I'd like to ask, uh, what are your views on this and, and how would you like to convince these people why they should still use the digital euro? Very interesting. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. So then with those three questions, then maybe we can get, um, we can uh, ask uh, Eileen or um, Jürgen. So just to sum up, uh, and I hope I can read my own very bad writing. Uh, so Gerhard was asking about the possibility to make effectively, is it possible to get a, a kind of a cheaper model? And that way we could go direct without having an expensive scheme in the middle, if I understood. I hope I haven't synthesized your, your, your question uh, too, too much, uh, Gerhard. Uh, Jonas was asking about whether this would be a Euro-based uh, or um, a kind of infrastructure would be developed on a very Euro-based level or outside of that. Is it possible that could be also open to some, some, uh, some players outside of the Euro area? And then, Mark, thank you very much for sharing on the survey. And also that point about a 3,000 Euro limit that up, up to a quarter of people wouldn't necessarily use it uh, based on the survey of people that you had um, that you had addressed and looked into. So maybe Evelyn or Jürgen, I don't know who wants to take any or either or all of those. Let, let me okay. take uh, the first and then Jürgen can add where I forget. So on the first point, um, so of course, when we now design the digital euro, we will do this in a way that we can do it as efficient uh, as possible. So that that is one element in uh, on which we hope uh, and strive for uh, a cost efficient solution uh, for for the merchants for all but also for the merchants uh, i think and the second one it's more connected also in the key objectives is that we believe if there is uh, sufficient competition in the market uh, that it, this will also uh, balance out in the market. So for us, the the, the econo economic efficiency is one of the key objectives that we have put in our key objectives, as I, I told you uh, uh, before at the beginning. And these are two the two elements that we think will contribute uh, to that. Then the other question, uh, whether this will be, uh, uh, how it will be sourced, I would say, um, I think I could say that indeed the strategic autonomy is very important and that this is a European solution is very uh, important to us as well. Once we go into procurement phase uh, for certain elements of the solution, we of course need to also follow uh, procurement rules that are there, but we're really looking for a European uh, solution. 
And then the last question on the holding limits. Um, this is something that we are still in a design phase. So the reason why we're thinking about holding limit limits is uh, to safeguard financial stability. And so one of the differences between central bank money and, and the current digital payment forms is, is that they use commercial bank money. Um, and the fact that the digital euro is a direct liability on the central bank does something with the liquidity position of the of the banks. Uh, that's also why we you know, that's one of the reasons why we said we don't want to crowd out the banks. Uh, we will be we want to have a portion in the market. Uh, we believe some of that portion will come from cash uh, because we uh, that is also one of the drivers to start thinking about the digital euro. But we do, we also foresee that it might take some of the liquidity uh, from from the commercial banks, and we need to safeguard also financial stability because the banks are also very important in that area for the for for Europe. What we are thinking is is what we call tools uh, to uh, to control the maximum amount in circulation or the amount in circulation. Um, and what we currently do is that we develop these kind of tools uh, and to say, okay, these we're going to put in. But we also know that uh, the financial situation uh, at the time of possible introduction is very different than now. So uh, a holding limit is considered, uh, but whether we're going to use it at the time of issuance and uh, what would be the height is something that we will only de uh, uh, decide much closer to the issuance date. Um, and I hope, and this is one of the things that we also want to test in the second round of focus group, but which is at the end of the uh, of the um, of this year, um, that next to having these tools that need to work to keep the financial stability. On the other hand, we need to make sure that the product stays uh, uh attractive and usable for uh for the for the users so we need to find a fine balance uh and um well, i hope that this answered your question thank you yeah thanks very much for the, the the really good questions and then also i think the comprehensive answers and so look we unfortunately we don't have time to take all the questions that are not the hands that are raised so that we can move on to the next topic as well but um perhaps we could ask jan and Martin. So Jan, you first, then Martin to ask a question. And then after that, please feel free to type your, your question in the chat and we will endeavor to address it separately afterwards uh, so that we, we we certainly want to capture all of your uh, your insights and thoughts on this. And so we can revert back to you on them too. So Jan, over to you uh, if you want to make a comment. Thank you very much, jean Alix from uh, Berg, the European Consumer Organization. Uh, competition is very important in payment. We have not enough competition. And uh, for this perspective, your digital EO is very much welcome. But uh, Evelyn has said at the beginning that the distribution will be done by supervised intermediary mentioning banks and PSPs. Uh, here, uh, I have doubt. Uh, because if I compare with um, cash, physical cash, it's more and more difficult for consumer to have access to physical cash. Why? Because banks are not interested in physical cash and you have another department of the ECB who is fighting for the uh, maintenance of the distribution of, of cash. And so uh, with uh, digital euro, if you give the distribution of digital euro to banks, it will happen the same things because banks will favor the uh, service, the payment means uh, for we, which are the most profitable for them. Uh, it's very clear, uh, and you, we see that with cash, uh, we see that with the non-development of instant payment, uh, because they consider that it's not profitable for them and they don't develop it. And so, uh, why not? You can, we can imagine that uh, you have uh, intermediary who should not be banks, but who should be uh, or national central bank or subsidiary of national central bank or any kind of uh, body uh, we, we those body uh, not having the possibility to kill the competition between the payment instrument. Here we see a huge concern and if at the end uh, you decide to distribute uh, digital euro through uh, the banking system, which measure will you take 
uh, to be sure that uh, the uh, the uh, digital euro will be really available to consumer not uh, what is the situation in cash where uh, the fees are more and more expensive where the etm are closing and so on and so on uh, it's a very uh, sensitive issue from the consumer side how the distribution of euro digital will be done thank you very much so uh very very much noted um martin do you want to a uh, very succinct comment uh, yeah. or yes please yeah so it was first on on the um, the questions that you put forward on the features of the digital euro i found it weird that you would ask if the digi digital euro should be a claim on the central bank because how could it be otherwise i mean it's like asking if a car should have four wheels um, but then so just had a quick question on the clarification between the difference with regular bank money and how would that be an added value um of the digital euro how would that be an added value especially if the commercial banks are the ones who will make it available now with regards to financial stability have you envisaged moving towards a full reserve monetary system and if not how would the creation and destruction mechanisms of the digital euro work so for instance when you send money bank money basically from one bank to another there are also assets that need to move between banks as well so bonds cash you know so how would it work when converting bank money to central bank currency would banks send the ECB an equivalent in assets to the money that is converted to digital euro by consumers or businesses? I mean, how would it basically work in that in that sense? So would, would the banks send you, for instance, the, the um, debts that they've created, for instance, the debt contracts or whatever that are an asset equivalent to the amount of cash or, or, or digital currency that, or currency that is converted into the digital euro? I mean, that's just very unclear to me, the destruction creation mechanism behind the digital euro and how you convert from one system to another. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So that's a big question. These are big questions, but I do have a short answer to these big questions. I mean, from yeah. I mean, the one that John raised, of course, as well, with regard to uh, a plea, really, that we don't um, we don't make it so that uh, the digital euro is sort of strangled. Yeah. Uh, and then the second question, of course, obviously, that you just heard. Um, the question on banknotes and competition is absolutely important and valid. And on the continuance of issuing banknotes from the central bank side, I think there's not one single speech, for example, from our board member or our president, where the topic of a digital euro is covered, where it's not made clear that we will continue to issue banknotes. So there's a, a clear promise from our side. Having said that, there's the competition between various payment solutions, front ends, or whatever it looks like in the, in the current system, and then with banknotes. In all those jurisdictions that we've observed, the decline in the usage of banknotes, of cash, has been mainly driven by the demand from customers and merchants. To our knowledge, at least, it was not necessarily the banks who were driving this. It's costly for them, that's true. But you go in various countries, in particular in the north of Europe, where it's the merchants and the consumers who prefer uh, to pay with other means of payments. What we can do is we want to take care that cash is still continued to be provided. Uh, and the second thing is that we want to have a competing environment where the private sector, when involved, comes up with innovative and competing solutions. And that should uh, put pressure on the various price and fees that probably will be there. The second speaker or um, that there was a there was a range of questions. First of all, apologies for explaining the difference between uh, the various claims that are out there. Um, it's good that you know this, this, but there's a lot of confusion elsewhere. What about the different digital monies are. So uh, it was supposed to be a service to those who are less educated than you are. Apologies for that. Second point is whether we've uh, reflected on coming up with a kind of Fallgeld or a full reserve system. No, we don't. So we are trying to come up with a solution that caters for the changes that we see, a digitalization of payments and it's actually not within our mandate to reflect upon the underlying financial system and the monetary system as it's established that would go beyond so we are acting within the existing financial system 
if there's a need to discuss this more fundamentally, uh, it would be more up to the elected parties, the parliament and the like to do this. That would stretch a bit our, our mission. I, I would leave it there. The Great. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Indeed. So, um, so it turns out that somebody voted just after we had finished the, at the start on the multiple choice. So uh, product features got knocked back and uh, privacy um, skipped up to the, to, to the higher level. We still will, of course, have time to talk about product features and design when we come to the end. But given then uh, that uh, the, uh, the voting process is sacrosanct, as we all know, uh, we'll stick with the uh, with uh, with privacy, even though we let someone vote it afterwards. We're sort of still saying that that's the case. Uh, so we'll, we'll we'll focus on privacy. So yeah, I mean, just slight introduction to privacy. Well, obviously, following on from those last two 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 questions or, or comments, which were really uh, uh, you know interesting and strong as well. Um, privacy is of clearly an area of concern for many. Uh, the, when we spoke about the digital euro in our digital euro consultation um, a couple of years ago, this came out quite strongly. It's important for us. In developing a digital euro as well uh, when we exchange money we communicate in some form we exchange information and the levels of data that we are willing or are kind of comfortable with transacting as part of that process or even in terms of what protections are available and what we are thinking about and how we're, we're thinking about it is something we'd like to um to explore more here as well so um there is a presentation uh, so, which uh, Jürgen will give, I think, now yep. on the topic of privacy. So, maybe to kind of sketch out the um, the levels and the approaches that we that we're looking at. I'll let Jürgen take it from here. Thank you very much, Ronan, and thank you for rating this so high because this is also very important to us. All the offered topics are important, but this is also particularly interesting because, as Ronan said in the public consultation, it was actually ranked highest. Whereas when we approached a bit closer the retail users, it was also ranked very high, but not the highest. So it's a very important but complex phenomenon. Um, and it's by no means a black and white discussion. So uh, there are huge areas which are grey, um, where we have to investigate how the whole thing will look like. And also very important, for the investigation phase, there's no decision taken yet, in particular because we are not the only ones who are involved here and having to decide it will also involve the co-legislator, so it's much broader and we are not completely free in deciding. But on the conceptual side, you have the extremes, so this is now to distinguish between not black and white, but with some grey areas at the wide range, in the extremes, you would have full anonymity like you have basically with cash um, what we can say here this has to be possibly uh, um, probably excluded because we could not then comply with aml and uh, other legislation that is probably not possible so we will not pursue that then the other extreme would be um, full transparency to the ecb we would know who's onboarding, we would see all the transaction data, the volumes and everything. So this would be a violation of our understanding what privacy actually means. So that's also basically and conceptually exclude, excluded. What we have then is a kind of a basic scenario that we more or less foresee that would be uh, in order to comply first with um, the legislation on AML and anti-terrorist financing, that the know your customer procedures would be taken when the client is onboarding and the transactions and maybe the volumes are seen when it's uh, are transparent, when it's required for AML purposes, for example. So next to this baseline scenario, we also have a, a view what could also be an option based on the technical and legal restrictions or possibilities that we see in the investigation phase. So that could be, for example, that um, we see we have a KYC, the Know Your Customer during onboarding. But beyond that, there wouldn't be much to be seen by the intermediary. And also an option that we could have a closer look up that we have a selective 
privacy levels that we could adjust. So let's say below a particular value, there are more relaxed um, transparency rules. And only when you exceed a certain transaction volume, then transparency has to increase. But again, so these gray areas need to undergo further investigations and examinations and we are not the only ones who decide there. So I think for the for the introduction of the topic, that's, that's Great. enough. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we still want to ask you a question. Uh, we still want to ask you a question to, um, to sort of maybe, again, just draw you out a bit on what it is that you yourselves feel uh, following on from Jürgen's presentation there. What level of privacy would you prefer? So again, if you wouldn't mind um, uh, voting on that in the same way that you have for the previous questions, that would be really helpful before we then kick off uh, another conversation discussion. So again, again, this is a, we'll, we'll focus on them all, but I mean, uh, anonymity, non-transparent um, to third party, transparent to an intermediary, the person sitting in the middle, selective privacy, uh, lots of different options. So, okay, I think, uh, it already, well, yeah, I spoke too soon. It's already moving. So selective privacy looks like it's coming out on top along with anonymity. So maybe we focus on those to get ourselves going in terms of the, of the conversation. And so um, maybe then if you could ask, maybe give us some of your comments and again, raise your hand in the chat and uh, we'll come to you. And if you could, when you're unmuting this time, maybe also give the, uh, the organization that you're speaking for. Thanks to those who already already did this when they were introducing themselves, but that would also be helpful. So uh, yeah, again, if anyone has any questions or thoughts on privacy, now would be uh, a really good time to uh, ask us some of your questions. It's, um, it's certainly, when I think of privacy, we also, we all think about privacy in the element of, uh, of cash instruments. And we, we, we have our, we obviously have our bank cards, our, our PayPal, we have so many different options. We have cash uh, and we all have strong views, it seems on what privacy means and how and how important it is to us when we're when we're making transactions when we're and we're choosing how we want to spend our money and uh, and how we want people to know about it for example and then of course we always have anti-money laundering considerations which are very important for us as a society so uh, there is also constraints and tensions no matter where you look so perhaps we would start with mark who thankfully uh, has uh, asked a question in the chat thanks very much mark so Mark, maybe over to you, if you want to unmute your mic and just maybe mention who you're, you're representing or your, your organization, and then please, your comment. Thanks a lot. I'm working for Positive Money Europe, NGO based in Brussels. Uh, again, referring to the survey we did in advance of this event, uh, about 30% of respondents showed, said that they are skeptical about the digital euro and about 20% said that they're outright against it. And this often referred to the concerns about privacy. Privacy was uh, ranked first in terms of uh, our respondents' importance that they attached to different design features. And I, I think there's a real danger in the ECB not taking this seriously enough. Uh, and I, I think it has potential to contribute to a failure in the digital euro in the sense that it limits uptake sufficiently, that, that it significantly limits uptakes. And a personal note, I am wondering why, to me, to me, it seems like the ECB is priv privileging compliance with um, AML and um, counter-terrorist financing legislation over the compliance with the fundamental right to privacy and the existing laws on data protection. And I don't understand why uh, it seems to me one would sacrifice compliance uh, of, uh, with regulations on privacy by ensuring compliance um, with other ML and CFT regulations. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's take a few more questions then together, uh, and then we will we will come to the answers. So, um, Martin Schmalzweed, if you want to unmute and tell us, yeah, who you're representing. So I'm representing uh, Cofase Families Europe, which is a European NGO representing families, um, representing the interests of consumers, families, civil society. So the questions I had, well, first I wanted to echo what has just been said. I mean, I also think that uh, we shouldn't uh, consider that AML is now set in stone and that we should not reconsider AML. And we've underlined that many times in financial inclusion because there's this hypocritical kind of attitude where 
obviously the people that are excluded from accessing the bank account are also in many cases people that cannot comply with AML because they're you know newly arrived migrants or they're homeless people so i mean this is it's, it's a very uh, hypocritical kind of thing to say that you know AML is what prevents us from doing things when there's sometimes other reasons for um, you know doing these kind of things and we should maybe rethink AML first um, and the second thing is a, a very quick question. Do you envisage to regulate stable coins to prevent them from being more appealing in terms of privacy? Because for now, there are many stable coins that you can access, open an account with no KYC procedure whatsoever. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Jonas, please. You're... Yes, thank you very much also for asking the question and uh, quite uh, interesting results, I guess. Um, well, I also want to provide you my, my perspective because I think selective privacy and anonymity is really a, a good way to go for a few reasons. Um, the first one is basically that we all want the digital euro in the end to be a success, of course, right? Um, but not as, as much as a success that it undermines financial stability, of course, right? But one USP um, it, that it could be is basically that, um, that you could provide just higher privacy than today's existing forms of money in the digital realm, right? So basically, and um, improve um, privacy here. And maybe the second comment is that very often it's said a CBDC is a digital form of cash, which I totally agree with. Um, but then I would also kind of expect that also the privacy levels are at least similar to cash, right? It don't need to be exactly the same. But for cash, we also have a threshold approach. So basically, as I would interpret it, selective privacy, that if there is a monetary threshold um, which is exceeded, then you have to do provide your information about yourself, right? And we have this for e-money today as well, but the thresholds are like in the uh, in the hundreds, that's way lower. So for me, it's in the end the balance where this limit lies for selective uh, selected privacy here. And and I personally hope that it's rather in the direction of cash and not e-money. But this is in the end also to be defined by the regu regulators in the end uh, jointly, of course, with the decision makers here. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jean. You have a question. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I think it's necessary to go more in detail about privacy. And uh, uh, the three uh, examples in blue uh, that in, in the slide uh, are for me not enough uh, precise. Uh, the question is not uh, uh, the uh, holding balance or that kind of thing. Uh, the question is uh, who can uh, know uh, what kind of transaction I have done. Uh, it's not the holding balance, uh, it's uh, the, the kind of transaction and uh, the fact that uh, this uh, is part of my uh, privacy. And uh, I think uh, as we guard uh, AML, um, for the time being in the package, uh, which are under discussion between the Council and the Parliament, uh, there is a debate on the uh, amount for cash transaction. Uh, the Commission has proposed 10,000, the Parliament is proposing 5,000. Uh, above this amount, no problem, uh, a full rule of IML will apply. But uh, for the amount uh, below the, uh, for the uh, when the uh, transaction when is done uh, below uh, this amount, why we uh, we don't apply for digital euro the same rules of, as for physical uh, for this physical cash? Uh, the idea is not uh, the, to, to uh, the holding balance and know your consumer when you uh, open an account, uh, because uh, I think the uh, e-identity will be uh, a possibility for that. But after that, uh, no knowledge of anybody on which kind of transaction I do. That's, uh, that's the same uh, situation as uh, for physical cash. And it's why I think it's necessary to elaborate more about the various categories and even your uh, choice, uh, uh, your preferred choice transparent to intermediary. Uh, I find that it's not at all uh, really uh, privacy protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very so much. Which, so, which kind, which kind of measure uh, you you imagine to to uh, to more protect this aspect of privacy of the transaction? I, I don't mention the fact the opening of the account. I I need uh, my concern is the protection of the transactions. Yeah, thank you. Um, so 
with that, um, I think what I would do is I would sort of maybe sum up and rather than responding to those, because I think these comments are very well made, I take your comment, Jan, which you just made there about protecting the transaction. Um, also, then Martin's comment about regulating stable coins and whether it's not a bit hypocritical sometimes to um, to basically not understand that that there are people who cannot comply with uh, financial inclusion rules simply because they're sort of not really captured by the system in the first place. And then also whether or not, again, by Mark, that we're um, perhaps privileging compliance over uh, the privacy of the um, of pro over privacy laws. So we take the, those all on board, maybe then with a view to maybe then uh, giving a couple. We have just a few more minutes. We're right nearly running out of time, but we did say we would have some time at the end for uh, more conversation, more more questions on anything else we haven't touched on yet. So perhaps we could do that for uh, five odd minutes and then we can close the session. So. With that, um, I would ask you if you have any more general questions that we haven't touched on or thoughts um, and granted, please note that we really do only have a few minutes left uh, before we have to close the session. So again, over to you, please, if you have any comments or final questions um, be before we close the session, please let us know. Hi, Jonas. Yes, you have a question or a comment. Please go ahead. Actually, it was my previous question, but first, I really thank you for inviting us and including us in the dialogue. So I think that's really a key, um, a key step and just wanted to say thank you and hope that we have um, more of these sessions in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, indeed. Um, anybody else then? Are we uh, going to be helped with our punctuality? Uh, no. Okay, then um, perhaps then. In conclusion, then, um, and I mean, following on from from that, Jonas said, thank you very much. Yeah, it's really all we have time for. Uh, thank you all for your time and particularly your contributions. I uh, hope you enjoyed our attempt to make this a more um, interactive uh, seminar. Uh, we're kind of building on the feedback we got from you before. And uh, of course, like all these sessions, we have a survey that we'd be very happy if you would answer just a couple of questions. Uh, this is anonymous. Uh, so. Um, no, uh, a full protection, as they say, and we're just um, only using this as a way of helping ourselves to to see how we could maybe improve these sessions in 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 the future. Uh, it just remains for me to say thanks very much to Evelyn and to Jurgen um, for shedding some additional light uh, on the investigation phase and for hearing the views of our civil society organisations today. Um, at the start, I posed some open-ended questions, and of course, this is not really resolvable in one hour. It will probably take us more months and uh, maybe years before we, we are definitively able to answer those questions. But we really are committed to hearing from you and to involving you in so far as we possibly can in this investigation phase. And uh, we do hope that today you felt seen and heard. And uh, thank you very much for that. So with that, I'd like to, to close the session and to say to you all, um, go well. And until we uh, see each other again, goodbye.